Hello and welcome everybody. It's Friday evening over here in Berlin, Friday morning over there in the US. And mm -hmm. we are welcoming all of you to the Mongo and Prisma office hours that we have here today at, to wrap up the MongoDB launch week that we at Prisma celebrated together with the MongoDB team um, in order to celebrate the uh, general availability launch of the MongoDB connector for Prisma. My name is Nicholas Burke. I'm a developer advocate at Prisma, and I'm here with Sabin Adams and Jesse Hall from MongoDB and from Prisma. Hey, Sabin, and hey, Jesse. How is it over there in the US? Hey, it's pretty good over here in California where I'm at. I think it's, uh, it's 10 a.m. and it's getting near like 80 degrees Fahrenheit already, so enjoying that hot spring weather. <laughs> nice day ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's been really nice weather here in Texas as well. It's about uh, noon here, so really, really nice. Nice. All right, so one of the main goals of today's session is to pick up a couple of questions that people in our community have or that we see people ask often. So at this point already, I want to encourage everybody who is watching this right now to think about the things that you're interested in when you think about Prisma, when you think about MongoDB, and maybe even about using the two together uh, to build an application. And these are the, exactly the kinds of questions that you can post in the chat so that Sabin and me, um, we can pick them up together with Jesse and uh, clarify anything that, um, that is unclear for you at the moment. And I th suggest, uh, Sabin and Jesse, that we start with a quick round of introductions so that everybody knows who we are and who these people are that they are talking to on the screen today. I can start. So I'm Nicholas Burke. I lead the developer advocacy team over here at Prisma. And actually, I've been with the company for five and a half years already by now. Before that, I actually used to be a mobile developer, mostly building uh, apps on the Apple platforms. Uh, with Swift and Objective-C back in the day. And only when I started working at Prisma, which back then was actually still called GraphQL, is when I started dipping my toes into the JavaScript ecosystem and learning about all the good stuff that we're working uh, with today. How about you, Sabin? How did you end up being a developer advocate at Prisma? Yeah, so um, I started off, I, I grew up uh, like programming and doing software development. My dad's a developer, so we kind of did projects on the side as I grew up. Um, I started going to school for it, but then I got offered a job. And since then, I did full stack development for just about seven years uh, in various stacks. So I used a lot of Java. I used a lot of uh, JavaScript and Cold Fusion. So I, I worked through all of that, and I got to work with a bunch of different teams and in a bunch of different workflows. And I got to the point where I was finding I really enjoyed the uh, the digging in and learning piece when I would be picking up something new. And I really liked sharing my experiences with those. So uh, that's when I started looking into developer advocacy. And so far, it's been great. I've been enjoying it a lot. All right. Yeah. And we'll actually talk a little bit about the, the kind of work that you have been doing here at Prisma in your first weeks a little bit later on this stream today as well. Cool. And Jesse, how did you end up being a developer advocate with, with MongoDB? Uh, yeah, so I, I've I've been a developer for um, about 20 years, and uh, I recently, and you might also know me from YouTube as Code Stacker. So I started a YouTube channel and figured out that I really like to to teach and to uh, interact with people, and, and so so that's kind of how I got into developer advocacy. I didn't even know that this was a job <laughs> until until then, until you know uh, I got offered this this job. So I didn't realize that I was actually a developer advocate just in general, not for any particular company. And then I thought, well, might as well do it for a company. And uh, I really like MongoDB. So that's, that's how I became a developer advocate at MongoDB. Very nice. And you said that you started programming 20 years ago. So I'm curious, what was the first programming language that you used? Uh, Python. Python. All right. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yep. So I've written some uh, <clears throat> Python, C Sharp. I've done some .NET work. Uh, but I, I landed on JavaScript and TypeScript. I just, uh, I don't know. That's, I, just, I just love that ecosystem. <laughs> That's very interesting. We actually recently had an internal conversation about which programming platforms we prefer, especially also with respect to kind of the, the Node.js ecosystem. And for me, uh, like what I said, coming from the, the background as a mobile developer, especially on the Apple platforms, where everything is 
really well uh, defined. Like there are best practices and patterns for all the problems that you encounter that you will encounter when you're building an app, and um, very proper documentation. One AD, uh, like one IDE that's Xcode that's responsible for all of your workflows. Uh, so for me, it was a proper culture shock coming <laughs> from that world to the Node.js ecosystem where it was pretty much the opposite. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, like interesting that that you feel that like the Node.js ecosystem uh, trumps, for example, I think the, the .NET ecosystem is uh, like maybe fairly similar to, to what I experienced there with Apple. Um, and to me, I have to say, I kind of uh, remember these good old days uh, a little bit where everything was, was in order. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, it's definitely the Wild West in, in the JavaScript <laughs> world. <laughs> That's what, I, I don't know, I guess I like that. <laughs> All right. Cool. So uh, before we jump into a couple of questions, I think that uh, maybe Sabin, you can give us a little bit of a demo and show mm -hmm. us what you have worked on during the MongoDB launch week. I think you also created a course about that. So maybe uh, like tell, also, uh, uh, tell people also where they can find that. Um, and maybe when you show us around in your code a little bit, that will inspire some questions in the audience that they can drop in the chat and that we can pick up later. So yeah. why don't you go ahead and share your screen, Sabin, and uh, talk a little bit about what you did there. All righty. Um, should be ready to go. Yes, here we are. Uh, is that visible for everybody? Yes, I just need to find the right setting here. <laughs> Perfect. Sweet. Uh, yeah, so uh, coming into the MongoDB uh, launch, I put together this application. And it's basically a miniature, like almost like a social media where you can uh, interact with other users. You can sign up for a account and then send messages to other users. Um, and I did this using MongoDB, of course, and Prisma. And uh, it's running on Remix. And it's all styled with Palin CSS. So um, it's a full stack application. And as Nicholas mentioned, I have a course going through pretty much every line of code in this whole application, uh, building it from the ground up, and then getting it deployed uh, to Vercel. And that comes in the form of blog posts and video posts. Uh, yes, and I just... can't uh, and I can't recommend this content enough. So um, you should set, uh, like certainly check it out. I had the pleasure to review it before publishing, and. Uh, it was very insightful for me, and I learned a ton. And I think if I did, then everybody watching here uh, will probably also take some valuable lessons from that. <laughs> hey, well, thanks. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, diving into the application and what it can actually do, um, we've got a sign-up form. And uh, that's right here, and a, and a sign-in form. And all of this is, um, all the data that gets stored with this is going to be stored through, via Prisma into MongoDB. And then it'll set up like a session-based authentication for your application. And in the tutorial, when we actually set that up, it's sort of like a, uh, like a homegrown session-based authentication. So you'll get to actually look at uh, how session-based auth works and how to get it set up. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, once you do log in, uh, you'll end up on this homepage here where you get a feed of all of the messages people have sent to you. And the idea of this website is that you just send congratulations or like tell people good job for things on here. This is a uh, just a kudos application. Um, and you get a list of users on the side where you can click and send a message to somebody. You can give it some styles. And then you can just say something nice. Aww. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> Oh, yeah. And I, I will say this is my wife here, and this is my uh, new baby. So they're, of course, oh. on this application, and I message them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Leland, I just love yep. the hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so over on this side over here, you're going to see the most three recent kudos sent. And I sent my wife a message here, so you, it pops up. And the message that was previously there popped off the bottom. Um, so we do a little bit of filtering there, and I'll jump into that in a second once we get into the code. And same up here, we do some filtering on the feed. Uh, and then finally, the other important thing to mention in this application is we do handle image uploads with AWS S3. So I will jump through how we do that a little bit. And deleting accounts while keeping into 
uh, account uh, referential integrity and making sure an entire user's data is deleted when you delete that user. Uh, but yeah, jumping into the code a little bit, we just have a uh, pretty much a simple Remix application. I started it up with their CLI and then uh, built off of their empty project. And throughout the course that I put out, we're going to build all of the routes of these um, and all of the different React components that display on, uh, on the browser. But the, the important part that I'm going to go through in, uh, in this little demo here is some of these utility files. These are where we're going to store uh, a lot of the like service files where we're going to be actually grabbing and updating data. Uh, and so those will all live here. And if it's you... really nice. I really like to uh, look at the file structure there because it really indicates that this is not a trivial application to build. It's not the typical kind of example to do app or the often used user post model that we use in a lot of our examples. But this is really like a real application where when you go through it and you learn how to build it yourself, you'll not only learn about the technologies involved, but also really about how to structure your code and about conventions to apply in your own project. So I think that makes this um, uh, like this entire demo and and the course that comes with it really really valuable for everybody who wants to look at okay what does it actually look like when I want to build a real application that goes beyond these very simple use cases that are often uh, covered in the documentation of the tools. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's uh, that was the goal of this. Is I've gone through so many to do applications and they're fun and I do end up learning a, a little bit about the technology, but then afterwards it's like okay where do I go next? So. This will hopefully dive into some of those more nitty gritty pieces. Um, and if you attended the advanced workshop, you would have gone through uh, building all of these queries. But of course, in the uh, blog posts and videos, we'll be going through all of these different Prisma queries and basically just showing how to handle relations um, in your data and a lot of filtering and sorting options and just how you'd model that out in, um, in a MongoDB setting. Uh, so, one of the important pieces that I wanted to pop open on this demo here is the schema for this application. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it later on this call, I believe. But the idea of applying a schema to your Mongo uh, data is kind of weird, considering it's a schemaless database. But um, I think we'll, we'll dive a little bit into later why this is actually important and why this is super helpful, especially when building a, uh, a little bit larger application like this. Uh, nice. But we've and got yet, relations. Uh, Oh, and yeah, to, to tease this maybe already a little bit, um, uh, so after uh, we see the segment here from Sabin where he shows what he has built with MongoDB and Prisma, we'll have a little bit of a philosophical conversation around the concept of a schema and really want to understand kind of, okay, is MongoDB actually a schema-less database? What does it mean to be a schema-less database? Where are schemas relevant when developing software? So is it only on the database layer or are there more areas where schemas are relevant? And I'm really looking forward to, to, to that conversation because schemas are really something I think that's the, that's like it's such an uh, like overloaded term um, and you you meet them everywhere it's really ubiquitous um, so I think untangling a little bit about the the terminology there and the trade-offs is what we'll do later in the stream mm -hmm. mm, yeah for sure um, and if you are if you are familiar with uh, working with schemaless databases and document stores hopefully this kind of stuff should excite you seeing these relation tags here um, and just a couple of these options, like these embedded documents that you could set up. Uh, it's super cool how easy the Prisma schema language makes it to set these up and handle in the generated uh, Prisma client. So uh, yeah, I think this is, that's about the general overview I wanted to give of the application. We looked at like the schema and some of the queries there. And if you want to know in more detail how the whole thing is put together, definitely check out the blog posts and videos. And if you have any questions, um, I think my contact info is out there pretty much all over the place. So feel free to shoot me a message and I'll definitely try to get your questions answered. That's awesome. Very, I mean, you, you really did. Cool. You thought of everything in this, in this, like I was thinking the same thing, like the to do, to do apps are great because they, they, um, they teach you everything that you need to know about the create, read, update, delete, they, you know, but they're kind of overdone. So how do you rethink it? And you've got the, the login and the, the security there, you've got, you, you've thought about everything. So this is a, a great demonstration. Cool. Yeah, thank you. 
Absolutely. And yeah, maybe also like tell people where they uh, like can find us or quickly open the Prisma blog so that um, oh, yeah, they sure. can quickly see the, the course that you've created for this as well. Sure. Well, the, the very first place is on the, uh, on the YouTube channel where the stream is. Um, we have a playlist there with the series. But then also if you go to the uh, prisma.io website, just go to the blog and um, a couple of these more recent posts, this is where you'll find them. Um, uh, yeah, it starts from one to five. It's a five-part series all the way up through deployment. So I think the, the last one was just released today. So they should all be uh, available. Yes. And on the risk of sounding like a broken record, I can't recommend them enough. Uh, in my mind, they really have the quality of a course that you fi uh, would find otherwise on, on Udemy or on Egghead. Uh, so it's really in-depth content that teaches you a lot about all the relevant concepts here. So yeah, go ahead and check it out. And thanks to you, Sabin, for walking us through the, uh, the app that you built. Absolutely. All right, <clears throat> then I would say we quickly check if there are any questions in the chat. And I think there's one that came up. And at this point, again, the reminder for everybody who's watching right now, uh, this is the time where you can ask any questions that you want to know about Prisma, about MongoDB, separate or together. And here is the first question from Apon. Does Prisma support nested MongoDB objects? Um, with nested MongoDB objects, I assume that you're referring to embedded documents. And um, the answer then is yes. Prisma uh, does support embedded documents uh, when using MongoDB. Uh, in fact, Sabin, um, maybe you still have your, your code handy. Um, I, I think do. in the Prisma schema, um, mm -hmm. you had an example of, of one. So we can go ahead and maybe quickly show that. Yeah. Um, um, we've you got... Can yeah, so like in, Prisma, like in the Prisma schema, you can define a relation either with a reference um, where you point to the object ID of another document in another collection, or you can do it as an embedded document. And that's what we have the type keyword for in Prisma. And indeed, here you have a relation field that's called profile, and it just refers to the profile type here that just defines the structure of an embedded document that's attached to a user model. Yeah, definitely. And then another thing that um, I'd actually gotten asked about by a buddy of mine a couple of days ago is um, how deep you can go with this. And I know I've played around with it a little bit, but you can actually nest even further uh, multiple levels of embedded documents. So if your structure has something like that that you need to account for, that's, that's definitely doable. Awesome. Interesting. Yeah, I'd actually be be uh, interested whether there's a limit to the level of nesting. Uh, generally, I wouldn't expect so because I guess MongoDB you can potentially also do infinite nesting. Uh, do you have any experience with that, Jesse? Uh, I, I would think that there would be a limit at some point, but you know what? Uh, off the top of my head, I can't. <laughs> I'd have to look it up. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe not indefinitely, but um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I assume that that like some mm -hmm. levels of nesting will be available. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, if you're nesting that's... too deep, that's probably a problem to look into completely separate. <laughs> exactly, yes. All right, uh, no further questions in the chat so far, but some uh, compliments from Anuj here. So thank you. And uh, interesting that you just have been working with Prisma just a few minutes ago. Is that for work or are you working on a hobby project where you're using uh, Prisma? And are you using it with MongoDB or with another database? Uh, feel free to, to drop the responses to that in the chat if you're up for it. All right, so I think uh, before we take any more questions or, or bring up more topics, I think let's just start talking a little bit about schemas in general, because I think this is a really interesting topic and a, quite of, uh, and a, and a really ubiquitous topic when it comes to the world of like, software engineering. And uh, yeah, maybe we can just start with uh, tr trying to define what a schema is just in our own words. I think nobody here has Wikipedia open on the side. Mm -hmm. um, and then just talk about where schemas appear in the software engineering world. So maybe uh, would, uh, uh, would one of you like to take a stab at uh, trying to, to define or I should go uh, or like, should I go with, with an attempt here, with the first attempt? I mean, just at the, oh, the most basic, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, go for it. 
Uh, was, Everybody wants most... to talk about schemas. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's what we're here for, right? <laughs> um, I think at the most basic level, a schema is a, a definition or a structure of, of your data. Yeah, exactly. definitely. My, yeah. my answer would have been similar. I was going to say a blueprint that defines the shape of your data and how it should flow through your, through your database. Yeah, exactly. I think the, the keywords here are uh, structure, shape, and data, right? Because that's really what, what the schema is there for, to, to make you or to, to make everybody aware of what the data that is flowing through an ap application uh, is structured like. Um, and uh, yeah, schemas, they appear everywhere in, in programming. And actually, uh, so maybe it's just me, but I also think that there is kind of a, pro, a prolifer, profiler, proliferation, is that the word? Um, <laughs> up and coming, like schemas are up and coming. Uh, you see them more and more is what I want to say. Um, and a couple of examples I can, I can think of here are, uh, are GraphQL, for example. Um, which also now gives you a schema for an API. Um, you would also even be able to add a schema to a REST API using a tool like Swagger or Open, IP, uh, open API specification. Um, and and that's maybe a little bit of a surprise, uh, a, like surprising take for some people. But in my mind, even TypeScript enables you to define a schema this time for your code. The types and interfaces that you define really in the end are nothing else than um, the, the structures of the objects that are flowing through your application. So in that sense, uh, I also consider kind of TypeScript types and interfaces also a way of, of schemas. Um, do you have any experience with, with these kinds of schemas or, or what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I think um, really I, I view schemas as like built-in documentation. Like you, you, the same thing with, uh, like you're saying with TypeScript, um, like you're, you're defining everything ahead of time so that when you go into development that uh, you don't make any mistakes down the road and it really aids you in that way as well. Yeah, I've, I've used schemas in a similar way where it's sort of built-in documentation. And then there's also a, another use for them that I've seen in tools like... Um, like Waspling, where you can almost define a schema to describe uh, how your application should look and how it should flow. And so I like to think of a schema as uh, a way to keep things out of your own head and have them written down so you don't have to remember everything. <laughs> uh, because I know my, my brain doesn't have enough room for all of the stuff I'm coding. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I really like the point that you both made about the built-in documentation. And in fact, it's not only built in in tools like GraphQL, where uh, the schema is then actually used to actually generate proper documentation that you can view, for example, when you're using graphical or the GraphQL playground. So um, the, the schema that um, you define for um, like whatever like you're working on, whether it's a GraphQL schema, a Prisma schema, or TypeScript types, um, this can be used as foundation to then kind of generate other things that depend on it, right? So the, the schema is just often a declarative way to determine the, the data structures of your application. And from that, you can derive whatever is useful in, in your particular context, right? And I think one good example of that are actually Prisma generators. Um, have you have you actually seen any uh, of the existing uh, existing Prisma generators, Jesse? Have you looked into that world a little bit? I don't. Th I don't think that I have. No. All right. Um, space, we still have. Um, we still have the um, the Prisma schema file open here, Sabin. So maybe you can scroll up a little bit, uh -huh. and we can um, draw attention to this generator block right there. So um, what this basically is is um, we are telling Prisma that whenever the Prisma CLI command, uh, Prisma generate is being executed and it reads this schema, um, the, the generate command, it will look at all the generator blocks and run the corresponding generator. Um, that generator is defined through the provider field right here. And in this schema and in most kind of default use cases when you're using Prisma, you'll only have this one generator block because maybe you only care about Prisma client at this point. But what's really cool is that you can add more uh, more generator blocks. And um, while we actually haven't built 
any other uh, any other generators ourselves. Our community was very busy building generators, and there are generators for a lot of different use cases. So, for example, there exists a generator that will. Um, basically generate a local web app that then represents the documentation, um, just like visual documentation for your individual Prisma client API. Uh, so that's super, uh, 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 super convenient. Um, then another thing could be when it's related to your stack. So it's a great place to put, a, to, to put plugins uh, when you're working with frameworks like Nest.js or when you're building GraphQL APIs and you want to um, improve some of your workflows there when you feel like, okay, um, the, the, the code that you're writing is more like, like boilerplate code that somehow depends on your Prisma models anyways. Well, build a Prisma generator for this to automate this workflow. Um, so the concept of, of Prisma generators, I think, is really, really powerful. And this is one example, basically, how schemas can help help to then derive whatever uh, whatever other code is is useful for for the current context mm -hmm. and the the same kind of concept of a generator i think also exists in the graphql world where you have this tool called graphql code generator i think it's built and maintained by the guild um, and they also have a ton of different generators that then allow you to generate whatever you need again uh, from a GraphQL schema. So, for example, um, React queries uh, or like React components that have baked in GraphQL queries um, or the corresponding React hooks that you need when you want to fetch that data. So it's really a, a, a very flexible concept, and, and I'm a big fan. Yeah, I saw the generator there in the code, but I didn't know that there were other use cases. So that's good to know. Yeah, there's even a, a nice tool out there that someone in the community built that makes it really simple for you to build your own generators. Um, mm -hmm. It's sort of like a CLI tool that sort of scaffolds it out and then you can get going from there. Um, so I think, yeah, the community has just taken this and ran with it. It's been really cool to see. That's awesome. <clears throat> Maybe you could even quickly pull up the Prisma docs, Sabin, because there mm -hmm. is a section in there. Um, about all the community generators, and maybe we can we can drop that in the chat then. If you just use the search and search for mm -hmm. community generators, it's the first thing that should pop up. Oh, all right. Oh wow. There's a, a long of list here. of all the existing ones. <laughs> wow. So yeah, just maybe grab that link and and drop it in the chat so that people can explore uh, all the available generators. Nice. For sure. All right. Um, before we move on to maybe talking about some of the benefits that people get when they're using Prisma with MongoDB, which is another topic that we want to cover today, I just want to raise the big question and I'll ask you, Jesse, is MongoDB a schema-less mm -hmm. database? Uh, technically, no, it's not schema-less. Uh, it has a flexible schema. Um, by default, the schema basically just validates that you have um, valid JSON. And so anything pretty much as long as it's valid JSON can be input. So, so by default, it's kind of open and then you can add on top of that. You can, uh, the, you know, it's, the schema is flexible. You can add uh, a schema on top of that to be as strict as you want. Um, then now the schema that it uses is actually the, the JSON schema, um, community, you know, it's, it's like a, a it's a actual known, um, uh, open source, uh, way to validate JSON uh, documents. And so that's uh, the schema that MongoDB uses, and it's at the database level. And so uh, you can actually define your, your schema uh, using the dollar JSON schema operator. Uh, and you can do that in Compass. Um, and again, that's at the document, uh, at the uh, database level. And so there's different ways to define your schema, right? So in Prisma, it's defined on the application level. And so that's in my mind, a little more helpful because you're going to get those those um, reminders there in your code editor uh, and, and those helpful hints and autocompletes and all of that as you're developing. Whereas if you do it at the database level in MongoDB, um, that, that's a good way to do it as well as as another way of you know ensuring that the schema is, is going to be validated throughout. Uh, but you're, you're only going to get the, that feedback when you actually, uh, you know, try to send something, you might get an error back saying that something, uh, you're, you're trying to pass something that is uh, uh, not validated by the schema. So there's different ways to approach it. 
Yeah. Okay. So the conclusion is it's complicated. Yes. But um, <laughs> but yeah, you 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 do have this built-in schema validation feature that that people can use, right? And yeah. I actually wanted to ask you about this. So maybe now is also a good time. Um, you you said that this is defined in MongoDB Atlas, right? So is this something or um, did, did I? Um, you you uh, can you can define it. Answer. Yeah, yeah. You can define it. Um, uh, I believe in the. Well, you know, I've, I've actually never done it from the Atlas dashboard. It m might be a, a, a feature in there. You could definitely mm -hmm. do it from the CLI, and you can also definitely do it okay. from Compass. I so, see, I see. So mm -hmm. it's nothing that's only available for Atlas, but it's something that's built into MongoDB, oh, actually, no yes. matter where or how you use it. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. That's a good clarification. Yes. And it uses um, uh, the, the structure, I think, of JSON schema, Yes. Um, to to define the schema, um, which is a a standard um, mm -hmm. that is uh, used by MongoDB there, and I think that's always a, a a good choice when you can kind of rely on existing standards and you don't have to invent your own thing. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, if if you look at the bullet list that's still open there um, of all the community generators, there is the Prisma schema generator for JSON schema as well, the third bullet. Oh, nice. Um, so I would be really curious if anybody yeah. in the uh, in the audience wants to try this out and basically see if it's compatible. You you start with a Prisma schema, you run this generator, you obtain the same Prisma schema in the form of JSON schema, and then you just take it and use it for MongoDB built-in schema validation. So I'd be really curious if that works, if, if the output of this generator is compatible with whatever is needed inside of MongoDB. But that, uh, that would be a really interesting experiment, I think. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to add that to my list of to-dos. <laughs> I want to I <laughs> see how it works out. Uh, because that that, again, you've got multiple layers of validation there. If you've got your, your Prisma schema, and then you, you use this generator to then uh, implement your database level schema. That's, yeah, that, that would be amazing. All right. Any final thoughts on the topic of schemas here? They're awesome. Doesn't, they're <laughs> awesome. That's, that's the conclusion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, good, good place to wrap up that discussion then and move on to maybe a couple of questions because I see that there was some activity in the chat. So let's see what people have been asking here. So first, does Prisma have plans to support more databases in the future? Um, the answer to this is clearly yes. We certainly do plan to support more databases in the future, but there is a little asterisk there because... Um, the future here is very, uh, very vague, and I don't know if the question was raised intentionally like this, but um, at the moment, it's indeed the case that for now, we are not actively investing into building new database connectors. So at the moment, we also have the CockroachDB connector that's still running in preview that's going to be released for GA very soon. Um, but after that connector is out, we are pretty much done with our uh, connector work for now in that w we, we then kind of want to take a step back and really make sure that all the existing connectors are supported optimally. Uh, for example, that means that instead of now building a new connector, say for Redis, we are first going to make sure that everybody who uses Prisma with Postgres at the moment really will get everything out of that combination. And uh, a couple of things are still missing there that a lot of Postgres users are asking for, especially, for example, when it comes to extensions like PostJS. That's, I think, one of our most commonly requested features that people really want to use all these great capabilities that they get from the database, and they just want to have them baked into Prisma as well so that they don't have to um, use workarounds to be able to access them. And um, that's going to be the focus for the next couple of months really make sure that uh, Prisma supports all the features of the underlying database, that um, people don't miss out on, on these capabilities. And then after a while, we're going to look at broadening again the range of databases that we support at Prisma. And um, then one step later, but this is probably we're talking one, two years ahead, is when we really want to um, spend more time also on the connector architecture and the interface and make it possible for um, external developers to build their own connectors. 
Um, but that's really a lot further down the road. Um, it's uh, really nothing that that we can already tackle in in any capacity. Um, the the code base uh, is for the connectors is implemented in Rust, so it's not straightforward to kind of build your own connector, especially since there are also um, uh, just like a lack of resources, lack of documentation around this. So um, this would be kind of a full-time job for anybody who who really wants to dive into this. And I don't think that anybody's so excited about a particular data source <laughs> that they would take this on them. If you want to uh, actually see how uh, the the implementation for MongoDB was was tackled uh, in, in Rust, there is an article uh, that was just published by one of the Prisma engineers on the MongoDB blog, and I'll share that in the chat as well. It was faster than you. The link's already there. Oh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yes, yes. Our engineering manager, he wrote a summary on the introspection feature that we implemented for MongoDB. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really well-written blog post. Um, I, I really enjoyed reading it. All right, let's take another question. Um, Again, from Anuj, I have questions how to submit form data to nested schema. I'm using Remix run with Prisma. Um, is that something that you have an intuition about, Sabin? Yeah. Uh, the number one thing I would say is uh, the, the course that we had mentioned before, the series of blog posts and videos, definitely check those out if you are working with uh, Remix and Prisma. That'll go through everything um, you'll need to know pretty much uh, building an application like this. I do... Uh, submit form data with a nested schema in there. And you'll find even just in the Prisma docs that uh, adding data to a nested schema is pretty simple. And it looks very similar to a normal update or create uh, query with a more traditional relational database. Uh, nice. Um, then let's move to the next question here. I think it's a follow-up question somehow, probably also related to Remix. Um, do you have an intuition, Sabin? Because otherwise, I think we'll need a little bit more context to respond to this. Yeah, I think this one would depend on what's actually going on in the code. So yeah, maybe some more context on that. Right. And if you have, uh, or if you if you don't have the time to to type the context uh, into the chat window right here, uh, then you can always go to GitHub Discussions in the Prisma repo and ask your questions there. So we have developer success engineers on the team who are monitoring the discussions there and are helping, trying to help out all our users. Uh, there is another question about pre-save and post-save. And I assume that this refers to um, hooks that you can use when you're using MongoDB. Is that is that right, Jesse? Well, I think there's another question a little bit further down too. Uh, is it possible to add pre and post middlewares? So I think um, I think they're speaking about middleware within right. the actual... Um, within Prisma. Prisma. And we yeah. actually do have a feature for this um, in, in Prisma Client. Yeah, that's convenient since we're already in the docs here, um, <laughs> why not pull it up? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so this is um, the, the documentation for Prisma's middleware functionality that would be the equivalent to these pre-save and post-save hooks uh, that, that you can use. And um, the, the way how it works actually is kind of similar to express middleware if you've used this. So you have this function, this middleware function that takes two arguments, um, the, the first one is just what, what's like coming into the middleware. And the second one is the middleware function itself that you then have to call again. Uh, and depending where you put your kind of like custom code inside of this function determines whether that's, uh, performed before or after the query. Is that, is that like somewhat accurate? Would you, uh, subscribe to, to that, uh, explanation, Sabin and Jesse? Yeah, that sounds, yeah. that sounds spot on to me. Yeah, it gives you a way to, to, to do something with the data before or after the save. Yeah, and there's examples here, too, with um, different possible uses for middleware. So if you're looking for a specific use case, a lot of these will be helpful. You can see um, how to do a couple of different things and some of the options that it gives you in, our, in the parameters. Mm -hmm. Nice. And then there is a question from James. What cloud hosting would you guys at Prisma recommend? Heroku? 
Um, so if you're talking about hosting your application or hosting your database or both, I think Heroku is a pretty solid choice. Uh, but there are so many of these hosting providers yeah. today, so it's it's really hard to to make a choice. And I have to say, I personally, I think A, have lost track of all the existing ones, and B, really don't have a, a strong preference myself. So Heroku signs, um, sounds like a good option. Uh, we also yesterday on the What's New and Prisma stream, we had, um, we had someone from the Redwood team on who showed how yeah, you can you. use, uh, what was it called? Railway? Yeah, Railway. Yeah, exactly. Railway as a, a hosting provider and even showed how you can use Railway uh, for hosting a MongoDB database as well. Uh, so if you're curious about that hosting provider, you can catch yesterday's What's New in Prisma episode on our uh, YouTube channel as well. Yeah, there, there's so many. I, th I think I just use a different one every time. Just, <laughs> just for some uh, Another thing that I might... Throw a dice. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing I might suggest is even looking at... Um, the Prisma data platform, depending on which uh, which database you're looking at setting up, there's an easy way to uh, sort of provision a database there and then manage your schema through there. So that that's something to look at as well. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> All right, uh, let's read this longer message here. I thought Prisma would act as a data access layer, which is flexible to many databases, providing us with a common API to communicate with different databases, abstracting away how it's mapping those calls internally. And we can switch out the underlying database whenever we want without disrupting our business logic. That's actually a super interesting mm -hmm. point yeah. and like certainly worth uh, a couple of minutes of conversation here because um, this is something that I think is a little bit of a misconception that, that people might have about Prisma. But it's also something that we talked uh, about a lot internally, like where do we stand on that conversation? How much of an actual database abstraction should we provide? And we actually ended up on a side of the spectrum where we say we actually don't want to abstract too much parts of the database. We rather just want to give a better developer experience to all the existing database features. Because if you're abstracting, if you're one abstraction layer that abstracts over all the different databases at once, um, it becomes a lot harder to make sure that all the underlying capabilities of the databases that have existed for years and that are really mature kind of technology projects, these databases, when you think of Postgres or Mongo or MySQL, um, these are rock solid uh, like pieces of technology. And uh, we don't want to um, take any of that power away from their users. So typically developers have a, a good reason why they're picking one database over another. Uh, for example, when they're working with Postgres, there are a lot of extensions for Postgres. And if you need to work with GeoData, then uh, there is a really great extension that lets you do that. Or when you're using MongoDB, there are things like embedded documents. Um, and um, we don't want to build an abstraction that just hides all of these away, but rather we want to enable all developers to take full advantage of the underlying capabilities of, uh, of, of the databases. Um, so uh, one, one way how to think about this is also with this uh, terminology that I think was first kind of coined in the React community um, when uh, the, or actually first actually in the mobile development community. I think uh, that's at least where I have heard it the first time. It's pr probably more u u ubiquitous again, but it's basically this idea of write once run anywhere. So mm -hmm. you write your code once and then you deploy that version of the code to a variety of different platforms. Um, and in the mobile development world, that kind of was the, 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 the goal that a lot of people wanted to, to have. Um, and a couple of the first frameworks, I think like Ionic, for example, they had this approach. They used HTML and JavaScript where people could write in that language and then deploy to the native Android phones, native iOS phones, um, and everything would be rendered in web views. But then React came along and they kind of um, revisited that mantra of write once, run anywhere to learn once, write anywhere. Um, because, for example, React Native, which is also a tool that you use, that you can use to to, to build mobile apps, um, it looks similar to to React. It kind of uses the same primitives and the same core logic, but it has different 
uh, different kinds of like uh, like base components, I want to say. So instead of using diffs and other HTML elements as the base components when building React Native applications, what you do is um, you use the native components um, of the respective mobile platforms. So for um, for the Apple platforms, that it would be a UI view, or for Android, I think it's just called a view. These kinds of base uh, visual components that people use to to build out their UIs. Um, so, yeah, think about Prisma more in that way. I think this learn once and uh, write anywhere is a lot more appropriate here because you, you learn the Prisma schema, you learn the syntax, you work with Prisma client and migrations, but then you can p apply that knowledge to every individual database with its respective uh, capabilities, strengths, um, and, and the things that you want to use in it. Yeah, I, I thought that as well coming into it that you could just swap out any database. Um, but I, I'm, you know, from hearing that explanation, it, it makes total sense as to why you wouldn't do that because you would, you would have to kind of take, you know, all of the things that ev all these databases do and kind of cut it down the middle. And you're going to lose things from different databases that, that they're capable of if you did that. And so it makes total sense as to why it doesn't. Yeah. And it was a, a long internal conversation we we had about this topic, and it took a while for for us internally to just clarify our our thinking in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, ah, yeah, and I also wanted to 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 add to this that it actually has become kind of a non-goal for us to be that one abstraction layer. So we are now kind of. Mm, very wary of of the uh, changes we're introducing in the Prisma schema, um, because we also find that this is actually also not a very common use case. So it's actually not something that people will want to do when they're running their uh, project for three years in production already. They're using Postgres. They probably won't think from one day to to another that they now want to switch to to MySQL. Mm -hmm. They really would have to have a really good reason to do that, and it's certainly not the majority of cases where this happens. Yeah, and I would also add to that that if a, a change of that size was taking place in an application, I'd imagine there'd be some revisiting of the schema and some of the uh, features of the new database. So even in that case, you would probably be changing up your Prisma schema anyways to some degree. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. All right. Uh, there are not any more questions uh, in the chat at the moment, so this is the last call for everybody to put up chest, uh, to to put up questions. While we we move on to our last segment, where we just can talk a little bit about the benefits that people get uh, when using Prisma with MongoDB. Like, why would you actually want to do that? And yeah, uh, uh, maybe one of you wants to to start with their kind of favorite benefit that developers get when they're using Prisma with MongoDB. Yeah, I, I can go. Um, I, I just, I enjoyed uh, the autocomplete and just knowing that whenever I am typing in, you know, whatever it is, that it is valid, it, it's going to work, uh, or just not having to remember all of the things and it's just right there automatic. Uh, as for the developer experience alone, like it's totally worth it. Yeah, I like uh, I, I like the structure it allows you to put in place in your application uh, logic. I think you'd mentioned earlier, Jesse, the difference between uh, the application layer and the database layer. And I, I've never actually really liked the term schema list because that implies that you're just throwing data at something and you don't really know what it's going to look like, but it's there. Um, where schema list in this sense really means the database doesn't have a schema. It's then up to you on the application layer to uh, apply that schema and to enforce it. There's still some sort of structure that you're going to need there. Um, and Prisma makes that really easy to handle that on your side without you having to uh, put all your processes and documentation in place. Yeah. Yeah, I think the whole idea is um, use MongoDB. Uh, it, it's kind of open to begin with, very flexible. And maybe you just have an idea and you're just throwing some things around. But once you start kind of honing in on what exactly it is that, that you're, you're trying to build here, uh, it's great to, to put some, some guardrails up and start, you know, start uh, you know, building that schema. And, and that's what Prisma helps uh, and makes it so easy to do. <clears throat> yeah, so 
My favorite one, I think, is uh, a little bit more on a high level. That that's basically also just a um, or like enabled by the Prisma schema as well. And that is, I think, that uh, using Prisma in a in a MongoDB project really also. Um, enables better kind of collaboration among team members um, because just by the fact that there now is a schema that makes all the data structures explicit um, it's just a, a lot easier for everybody to understand what's actually going on in the database how the data is supposed to be structured and then of course uh, by kind of generating the according types in TypeScript uh, Prisma also enables this auto completion that really is just a, the the ultimate productivity boost. If you ask me, um, it it really is a game changer where you now don't need to have the API documentation uh, for the library that you're using open all the time because you just hit Control Space and it shows you all the options. So you can get a very very long way with that, and this is certainly one of the benefits that gets called out repeatedly by everybody who's uh, who's starting to to use Prisma. Especially when you have Copilot enabled, right? <laughs> yes. We we experienced that in our workshop on on Monday. Um, that was that was definitely fun. That was another level of auto completion. <laughs> uh, I I know one time I jumped into at, at a new job. I had jumped into a big project using MongoDB, and there was a smaller team working on it, so there wasn't a whole lot of documentation. Everyone who was on the team had sort of helped build it, so they knew where everything was. But coming in as a new developer, it would have been nice to have um, something like the Prisma schema to be able to see where things are and get that autocomplete. So I can definitely see the value of this, and it gets me really excited for, for using MongoDB in the future with, with this. Right. And one cool thing that we uh, slightly touched on when we were talking about the how we built this engineering article that we published on the MongoDB blog um, is the topic of introspection, uh, mm -hmm. because that's actually really, really convenient if you already have an existing MongoDB database. Um, it's It can be very cumbersome uh, to actually go in and now make all of this the structures inside of your MongoDB collections explicit by typing out the Prisma models. So that's when you can use Prisma's introspection to read the structures inside of the database. And Prisma is just going to generate the Prisma models and populate the Prisma schema for you. And that's actually also just the easiest way to get started with Prisma in general, I would say. So everybody who's kind of... Uh, who has the side project or has um, a, a database available at work, it's so easy to just go and run introspection against that and just fire off a couple of Prisma client queries after that because, uh, yeah, it's just, just be super fast to, to, to set everything up and to um, start, um, start getting the benefits of Prisma that we mentioned. Yeah, I, I tried that the other day and it was like magic. It just, <laughs> I, I just had a schema right away. It's like, wow. Awesome. All right. There are no further questions in the chat. I would suggest that we wrap up with a couple of plugs. So um, I don't know if there are any exciting things coming up in the MongoDB community. Uh, I think there is one that's certainly exciting that, that you can talk about. That's MongoDB World, Jesse. But before that, um, we also have a conference here at Prisma, and that's called Prisma Day. Um, and the, the browser is still open, Sabin. So why don't you quickly go to prisma.io slash day uh, so that um, people can see how they can sign up for this. So Prisma Day is our yearly uh, developer, um, our yearly developer conference that we do at Prisma. This year it'll be hybrid, so in person and online. It's going to happen in Berlin, where the most of the team is based. And uh, yeah, it's going to be really, really fun. We'll publish the schedule very soon, and I'm excited for this and hope to see many of you there. Yes. And then, of course, the second plug is really just all the content that we created throughout the MongoDB launch week. So Sabin created an amazing course on building a full stack app with MongoDB Remix and Prisma. We ran two workshops uh, that are going to be published on the Prisma YouTube channel uh, the next week. And uh, yeah, in general, I think there was just a lot of fun stuff going on that everybody can catch up on. Yeah the week before Prisma Day. So, and it's in New York City. It's going to be live. 
And uh, anyone that's going to be in the area, if you want to join us, uh, tickets are still on uh, early bird pricing right now. And actually, I have a special coupon code for everyone here. If you use the code Jesse Hall 25, uh, that will get you 25% off the early, early bird ticket price. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, I think we can wrap up. So Sabin and Jesse, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, this was a lot of fun and I'm sure it wasn't the last time that we meet each other on stream. So until next time. Hopefully in person soon. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> See ya.